What's up guys, welcome to the channel. I'm Chris Lato, retired F-16 pilot, now UAP investigator, and I'm super excited about this video. I was just doing a Nimitz uh, research investigation for Nimitz deep dive. Luckily, Jeremy Corbell just released his video with Chad Underwood. Commander Chad Underwood was the man or of the crew that filmed the Tic Tac from the famous FLIR 1 video. And this is the first time he's actually uh, shown his face. I'm very happy. Very excited. Thank you, Chad Underwood, for sticking your neck out and engaging on this topic. I know it's difficult. And thank you, Jeremy Corbell, for your continued release of all these awesome interviews. For this video, I have a ton of notes. I was very excited about it. As always, uh, please like and subscribe. I'm setting up a Patreon account now. If you would like to support that, please consider it for the future. Let's get right to it. They were like, hey, did you see a, a, a UFO too? And I'm like, actually, I got it up here on video. They were like, you know, their eyeballs just, you know, were like, whoa. And, um, and so we popped the tapes in and uh, they were like, what would you describe this as? And my thoughts going through my head were the scene from Airplane where um, uh, the reporters are asking that guy, Johnny, one of the ground controllers of like, can you describe this plane? And he's like, oh, it's a big white shiny plane with wheels. And you know, it looks like a big Tylenol. What kind of plane is it? Oh, it's a big, pretty white plane with red stripes, and curtains in the window and wheels. And it looks like a big Tylenol. And I knew if I described it as a big Tylenol that no, that's too much not taking it seriously. So that's so funny. That's how that's how it was named, the Tic Tac. It's from the movie Airplane, which is just perfect. This is just the culture of uh, fighter pilots and, and the Navy. So when you go into the CDC, you've got your radar data and your FLIR footage. Is that all on the same eight millimeter format? Yeah, it's called CIDIC, uh, oh, Carrier, CIDIC. Ve Carrier Vehicle Intelligence Center. Um, that's where we always go. You know, I'm still in my flight gear. That's that's I don't even take my gear off. At the time, there were two two sets of tapes that you would put in. One was for the right hand display. One was for the left hand display. Um, just so, you know, we could record those simultaneously. This is interesting because we also have the same crappy eight millimeter tapes that you, and you have these little eight mil tapes players in just jammed in. It's like little VCRs jammed into the planes in these in these weird locations. In the Viper, we could actually swap so we can film the HUD or we can choose to film the right MFD or the right display. And this changes actually how we do our operations and such. So it's interesting that they could only film their displays. Uh, so it means to me that there's probably not a HUD tape, but the radar tape does exist. Unfortunately, he talks about it's probably not going to be released uh, anytime in the near future. So that's just based on classification stuff. They can't, they can't release that. And you did pick this thing up on radar first. Correct. Yeah. Okay. You saw other sensor data. You saw radar data. Yeah, of course. So once I got the target of interest on my radar, I took a lock and that's when all the kind of the, the funky things started happening. The erratic nature of the Tic Tac, the airspeed was very telling to me. And then we started seeing what we call jam strobe lines. Strobe lines are vertical lines that show up on your radar that are indications that you're being jammed. This is interesting, actually. So I kind of made two big changes after, after watching this. The first one is I think the jamming is way more important than I first considered. Thanks to subscribers for pointing that out. I was actually electronic attack expert for the aggressor. So all I did was study enemy or adversary electronic attack capabilities. And that's really China and Russia is what I was studying at that time. But really about the same time, I was analyzing deep on what Russia and our adversaries' capabilities were. And I can tell you from an EA perspective is it was nothing close to this. So this is interesting. So he locks it with his radar. So he must have gotten a point out or he did get a point out from the Princeton. He also says an E-2 Hawkeye was out there, which is really interesting. And the E-2 Hawkeye, he was coordinating with him. Uh, and sounds like he was also searching. That Hawkeye was also searching, which is command and control. They have a big radar on top. They can um, look down so they don't have any issues if anything goes low and they have a ton of sensors on there. This is the first time he mentions the radar lock. So he locks in, he gets a point out from the Princeton. He locks in with his own radar, which means he was able to lock this thing. Okay, so, you know, initially, if your radar is just in a scan mode, it's just kind of barely touching anything out there, okay? But as soon as you command a single target track, now all of a sudden you're staring, it, the radar staring with all of its energy. It's like flashlights just on max uh, to try and get a weapons quality track. And that's where he, he notices, or he says he notices, all these discrepancies. And this is an indication of jamming. As far as electronic attack, it's it's very classified, okay? No country or any officers really ever talk about their nation's electronic attack capabilities. It's just so information heavy. If you know all the specs for the, the radar that you're facing, now you can design anti-radar systems that specifically jam those or give what's called deception tactics. So deception tactics is, is what he's mentioning here. Digital radio frequency memory, that was digital 
EA tactics where you could do these amazing deception techniques, right? Because you're, you're digitally storing the radar's energy and then you're changing it a little bit and then you're sending it back. So it's exactly, exactly the, the radar energy that's being set out by the fighter with Durfum jamming now, with that capability, it's digital. You can send back the exact same, you can tweak it a little bit and that's where you can see these airspeed differences and you can see uh, altitude differences. Your radar, it, it does kind of weird stuff, okay? Now, what he, what he talks about next is the strobe lines. So if you just get strobes, that's basically that you just have, you're being jammed, like there's absolutely, you can see nothing, okay? But you know exactly where it's coming from. So that's where you can angle in on jamming. Uh, you don't know how far away it is. We're denying range with noise jamming uh, is the point of it. So he talks about two different types of jamming there, which is, which is very, very interesting. And after my discussion with Mick West, uh, I'm convinced now that this thing is just going in an easy path from uh, right to left across his nose. Okay, so what does that mean? It means we have a side aspect view of this thing, okay, from the side. I think based on, based on the, the aspect, it's going a little bit further away, okay? But why is this really interesting to me? This is really interesting to me because adversary fighters and knowing, knowing their enemy capabilities, I don't know of any pod that can actually jam out the sides. There's no jamming pods out the sides. So this is the best jamming pod I knew about, at least um, from the Russians, okay? The SAP 518, and this thing is an ass kicker. The Russians know how to use jamming. They just use a lot of analog techniques. Um, so this thing, this is this big jammer, hangs out on the wingtips. So this is like a SAP 518. This is a, a fighter self-protection jammer, okay? Even this thing, as far as I know, cannot jam out the sides, okay? These things can receive. So all fighters have radar warning receivers that are normally 360 degrees, but the same thing as our radar, okay? Because it's using the same technology, it still needs a radome and it's not ASA, okay? So it's, the radome is actually pointing forward, if you see here, see how it's pointing forward? So that means the jamming is limited to the front sector or the rear sector, okay? So we could jam forward or backwards. And I mean, I remember pointing, specifically pointing the jammer right at uh, any planes that were attacking me. So I think this is a big deal, actually. Nothing I know of can jam out of the sides. Yeah. Favors interviews. Could you clarify about that? Were you consulted for that report? Is it just wrong? I was not consulted for that report. I have been interviewed one-tenth of 1% 1 from the government as I have from yourself. I did get jamming cues on my radar tape and you can see cues of jamming on both your radar and your flare tape. Yeah. You know, when, when like uh, Commander Fraber described on your flare tape, when you see like 99.9 .9, uh, range to target, that means, that means you're being jammed. It was seen on your SA at, at the time, not just your own radar? Yes. Was there any other traffic at the cap point during the intercept? No, nothing at all. And we were flying what uh, we call the whiskey areas. Um, they're restricted for military aircraft and we schedule those um, more or less for a safety of flights, just to make sure that um, any other military aircraft or civilian aircraft for that matter are not flying in that um, sector of airspace. It's just crazy to me. He wasn't, he hasn't been interviewed by any government agencies. You know, what, what is ATIP doing? You know, did they not interview Chad Underwood? That just seems really crazy to me. Uh, and I can see that, you know, a lot of people ask, how could this happen? You know, you pass this information up. How, why doesn't, why didn't they do anything with it? And it's just, you have to remember that the government is the biggest business, okay? It's a business, it should be, the customer should be the people, right? Uh, but it's the biggest, largest business. And that means it's, there's a ton of layers of bureaucracy, okay? So as you pass something up, you just have to go through all these plinket holes of bureaucracy levels. Okay, and at any point, any one of those people, if there's one dumbass bureaucrat in there, and I say that, one dumbass bureaucrat in there that, that doesn't see it or doesn't think it's, a, it's important enough to forward up or doesn't believe in it for whatever reason, then they just kill it. And that's happened to me several times in my career. You just can't get through. It's like a ceiling of stupidity or something. And, and that just happens in any organization where you, you, know, you have stove piping and we have classification issues. Anything related to electronic attack now is gonna be, you know, super classified. And the only reason they're even talking about this now, even this level, uh, is because it's happened 17 years ago. Yeah, there was, there was nothing that wouldn't be identifiable in the sector of airspace that we were flying. And the way that this object was behaving was not indicative of how a civilian or commercial aircraft would fly. Another interesting point, Jeremy mentions that it was shown on your SA. So SA is your situational awareness screen, and they should be getting data link information from uh, the Princeton, and what's also really interesting is that E2 was out there. I didn't really consider that. E2 Hawkeye, these things are awesome. This is an E2 Hawkeye, and I've worked with the French E2 Hawkeye, 
in Europe, and those guys are badass. I mean, really, really good. They really know what they're doing. They're very effective. Um, they've been doing the same mission for decades. They're very good at it. I mean, this thing lands off of a carrier. Think about that. Uh, this is a mention on the radar, okay? The reason they have these crazy circular radars is from our mechanically scanned array radar, that technology, it has to be shaped like this, okay? So that's why these guys can look out the side because they have this crazy radar on top. And I promise you, they will, would not want to have this crazy radar on top, although it does provide some lift uh, from what I understand. You know, the new fancy radars, it's just like a big, it's an electronically scanned array, just flat plate you'll see on the newer on the newer AWACS platforms or airborne warning and control. This is what it looks like inside. So they have access to their radar and they have a lot of other technology there. They have a lot of technology, okay? A lot of it is classified. Uh, I don't even know about a lot of it, but I'm just saying that these guys have all of the newest technology at the time. It was the E2C Hawkeye. It should have been upgraded. They were preparing, I'm assuming, to go downrange as well. Uh, with the carriers, so I'm guessing they have the newest technology available. So these guys are also out there. You have to remember that it's not just the Princeton radar, uh, it's also the E2 Hawkeye is, is off axis, okay? So the question is, did they receive jamming cues? You know, were they getting jammed as well? That That's a great question uh, I would like to ask those guys. So very interesting. I didn't realize the E2 Hawkeye was out there. That even provides another level of, you know, it just provides another asset out there to, <laughs> to try and, Explain to you guys why it's so weird that they could not find this thing. Was there any other traffic at the cap point during the intercept? No, no nothing at all. And we were flying what uh, we call the whiskey areas. Um, they're restricted for military aircraft and we schedule those um, more or less for a safety of flights, just to make sure that um, any other military aircraft or civilian aircraft for that matter are not flying in that um, sector of airspace. So that's just, he talks about whiskey areas. Okay, so a whiskey area is a warning area. We call them as well. A uh, warning area is airspace of defined dimensions extending from three nautical miles outward from the coast of the United States contains activity that may be hazardous to non-participating aircraft. The purpose of such warning area is to warn non-participating pilots of the potential danger. A warning area may be located over domestic or international waters or boats. So they call them whiskey areas. So I haven't been able to find a good map of the whiskey areas out there. If any, if anyone has a map of the whiskey areas, let me know. But this is basically uh, the airspace, okay, as it's as it's drawn out, uh, and they're basically fighting somewhere right around here. So you can see it's in the whiskey airspace. Now these are regular airspaces they use every day, okay, and they're probably going to use the same cap point. Actually, I know a lot of people have talked about the cap point. How do they know? Were they like reading Fravor's mind or something? Uh, I think it's just that's going to be the cap point that everybody probably uses um, if you look at it. So if we go here. Okay, so this is basically where it happens. You have uh, San Clement Island up here. Remember that? Basically, the Omaha event happened here. And now this is uh, the Nimitz. So the USS Nimitz was, was located here. And this is their cap location. Okay, so among the whiskeys, once I get a good map of the whiskeys, I can, I can show you guys. Uh, you know, it's, it's just right on the 31, uh, 118 line. You know, they're just picking a point. Um, so while basically Fravor and Dietrich were flying out here. Uh, they were vectored over to this area, 60 miles to the west, uh, and that's where they had the Tic Tac engagement, okay? Uh, and then after the Tic Tac left, they said, hey, it's at your cap location. So Fravor was basically out of gas, came back. He told uh, Underwood, his crew, to go out and check out the area, okay? So I think they were originally flying over here because this is where Underwood told him to go as a two-ship, uh, and then they split. So as a two ship, Underwood, I believe, went this way uh, and his wingman uh, went this way to check out this area. So that's where Underwood basically came into contact with the Tic Tac. So pretty interesting. And the way that this object was behaving was not indicative of how a civilian or commercial aircraft would fly. Until you see the aggressive maneuver to the left off of my flare, anything that is gonna do is gonna be tracked by the flare. And so when the target maneuvered off to the left of my screen, as you see on the uh, flare display, that was a result of that object maneuvering itself, not me maneuvering my own aircraft. This completely went off to your left, lost track at that moment the video ends, right? Right, yeah, it, yeah, as we talked about earlier. Because people are saying it loses track when the bars are widening and, and it's not losing track. It's, it's just... maintaining track. When it widens its bars, it's, it, it's basically telling me that it's it's losing confidence in that track, but then it goes back. You know, you see it, it, it widens out and then it goes back. It never dragged off the target. Okay, so I recently had a discussion, a uh, long live stream with Mick West. Uh, you can. Click on that, see what we discussed. The main point of that is 
this talk of shooting off to the left. From the angle analysis on the FLIR 1 video, if you're using the field of view from the SCU report, then Mick West, his point is you can't actually prove from the video alone that this thing does some crazy advanced dynamic maneuvering that we can't explain. What I tried to explain to Mick is also, that doesn't mean that you, it disproves it, okay? So I created a video here just to show you that based on the field of views, we still don't know whether it did advanced maneuvering or if it didn't, the video doesn't prove it. It also doesn't disprove that there was an advanced maneuvering. So let me show you this here. So this is, I believe, wide field of view, uh, zoom 2.0, just to give you an idea. Okay, so this is zoomed in 2.0, so it's, it's three degrees across, uh, three degrees up. That is your wide field of view zoomed in. Okay, if you zoom out now, it's gonna be twice as big. You know, it's gonna be bigger than the whole screen. If you can just imagine how much sky you're gonna be seeing, because this is the FLIR 1 video that we're actually watching when he's in narrow field of view compared to the wide field of view. So this is uh, zoom uh, 2.0 at the very end. Uh, and you can see here, it's only 0.35 degrees across. So that is, it's just a super, super small uh, soda straw, if you will. What I did is I made a video here showing what would be the actual tracking rate across. So each one of these is a degree, okay? This is eight degrees left, this is seven degrees left, and this is nine degrees left. What happens in the video is this goes from seven left here, so as it's crossing set, it goes to eight left, okay? And then we never see nine left, but it's still very far over here. So watch through the video and see what happens. Tracking across. Brakes lock, now it goes. Okay, so I added a little brake lock animation in there, but I also show it uh, the other way as well. Okay, so let's look, let's assume there is an actual brake lock. I believe actually you can tell, I think he slew. So this is 50% speed. We get a brake lock there, and now I believe he slews faster to the left. This is just continuous tracking all the way across. And I'll show you because Commander Underwood says that it maneuvered, okay? It didn't, it wasn't him maneuvering the airplane to break the lock. It actually maneuvered outside the field of view. And I'll show you that, what that would look like. So even if it was continuously tracking, okay? Continuously tracking, it still could have done an advanced dynamic maneuver. Like it doesn't prove it either way, but it, it also doesn't definitively prove, at least in my mind, from the video alone that, that it did some advanced dynamic maneuvering, although he says it very clearly. Uh, this should also highlight to you that all he has to do is zoom out, is go back, which, which he's been doing the whole time, is changing field of view. What I would do immediately, if this went on my field of view, is I would, I would start slewing left, which I believe we, we see in the video, and then I will go back to a wide field of view. And now you should see a little dot somewhere here, okay? Because it's slewing this way. Now here's gonna be the center of your pod. So I would have a wide field of view covering larger than this whole screen looking for this little dot out here. And that's what freaked him out, that th there was nothing there. And that, that's just, it's just crazy to me. And my main question for that would be, does Chad Underwood, does he remember actually slewing left? Because if we actually look at the video, I, I think it does actually slew left. Okay, let me show you why I think he slews. Okay, so this is basically right where uh, brakes lock. I'm just gonna frame through. There you see that jump, okay, which is weird. But now there is some speed differences. So if we look here, okay, if we call this one unit of measure, and now I go one, two, three to here, okay, it's gone another one unit of measure in three frames. And, and so based on that speed, you'll look here, it, it will, the speed will change and also it will jump up here. Watch, one, two, three, jump, starts jumping up. Okay, so the speed kind of changed there. You see it's, it actually kind of slowed down in my mind. So I think he may be slewing it, uh, slewing the pod to the left. See this little jink, watch this. Pink. It goes up, watch. Up, he pinks up. I mean, is that, is that the object just miraculously going up? I believe it's the pod kind of moving. And that's why I think he's, he's, he realized it's lost and now he's trying to slew to catch it. And so I bet this last little point here is actually, uh, he's actually slewing to the left. That, that's my guess. He got on the radar, I'm like, hey, where is this thing? Because uh, I only have a certain scan volume with my radar and my FLIR and this thing is gone. And so I immediately radioed the Princeton in my E2 Hawkeye controller. That's interesting right there. Okay, so he had the Princeton, both the Princeton and the E2 Hawkeye were, were watching this thing. So I, 
He, I mean, he's just got to be blown away. Like, it's just totally gone. I've already mentioned the E2 is an airborne warning and control system. I mean, they have a ton of capabilities. <laughs> they should have been able to see it. I mean, it's just great. Immediately aggressively ma maneuvered my fighter to the left to try to reacquire. And it, it moved with a velocity that I've, I've not seen. I should be able to reacquire that aircraft or whatever it was. Right. And that, that's just... I mean, we're talking a, a, an $80 million fighter, you know. It yeah, so, I mean, this thing shot off at beyond hypersonic speed. If you can't bank the aircraft and then reacquire it, yeah. something, it, it shot off. Yeah, and my estimation at this point is that it was about 10 to 15 miles off my nose. I should be able to see an exhaust plume on my FLIR. You should be able to see that heat. I should be able to tell that it's an aircraft. It's, it's got wings. I should be able to tell what type of aircraft it is. I should be able to know that. And, and I wasn't seeing any of that. So he looks, it's just gone. Again, there's nothing faster than an F-18 out there, okay, that we know about. There's nothing that can jam from the sides that we know about. And then how did this thing get away? You know, we picked it up on the radar, so it's obviously not like some super stealth aircraft. They're able to see it. You can see it with the IR camera. <laughs> so just so weird, man, it just totally disappeared. The analogy I think of is like, you're chasing someone and you see them go around a corner and then you go running around the corner and it's just like a dead end and there's nobody there. It's like in a Spider-Man movie or something like he just like disappeared or something. That's the analogy I would make. Another good point there is he says, I estimated 10 to 15 nautical miles. That's, that's great because that's what I estimated as well. Uh, talking to Mick West and that will help me uh, analyze project. project. Which has happened to you. You have encountered something that is a black project and you yeah. had to debrief because, and there's a protocol for that. Exactly. What happens is when you're in the, the intelligence center, um, CIDIC, you describe what you saw. They describe what you've seen they make you sign a non-disclosure agreement or an NDA and they say, this is the project name. They don't describe what it is or what it, what it does or, you know, anything like that. It's just, you know, you, you shall not speak of this again. That did not happen with the Tic Tac. That mm -hmm. did not happen. Nope. So no. nobody said to you, this is, you saw something you shouldn't, this is a black project, you know, sign this NDA. That, that is the protocol. That's what would have happened if it was US technology, right. US black technology, but that didn't happen. Nope. And it didn't, didn't happen with uh, Commander Faber either. What do you think you saw? So that I've actually never accidentally seen a, uh you know, whatever, a black program, whatever they're calling it. But I know the process he's talking about. And they, yeah, again, just super weird. The other reason is why would you be, tr why would you be putting your black projects in known whiskey areas? So it's not like the ship is out in the middle of the random ocean, you know, total blue water, and it's just doing their own training that they want to do. No, they're, you know, they're adhering, they're using airspace, normal airspace, the whiskey airspaces. So why would a black U.S. project use known whiskey airspaces that are scheduled already? It just doesn't make, doesn't make any sense. And then as an expert, you know, I was an expert in foreign technology at that time. I can tell you that I never saw any of these even close to these capabilities from our adversaries. You know, when I went, you know, into the CIA, NASIC, all the top intel, high level information places, and I can tell you that um, as far as I knew, this is nothing close to what we had. And he even goes on to say that this is nothing close to what we have now. And I, and I agree with that. At least nothing that could do those type of speeds. But I think you could probably jam out the side. I'm sure there's something that can jam out the side. Uh, and there may be other things that can be more stealth or some sort of IR cloaking technology. Again, I don't, I don't know about any of that stuff. Oh, totally. This could have been a vehicle, an extraterrestrial vehicle. We don't know. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, totally. And, you know, as a rational human being, I, I leave that completely on the table. It, it, has, it has to be, as a, as a logical, rational person. The evidence that it's our black technologies, um, that seems to be dwindling. That seems to be going away. Yeah, it, that, that seems to be the case. I, I think the Pentagon and the, the folks that put these reports out, I think that that is the correct assessment. So their assessment is it's not our technology, and we don't assess that any of our adversaries could possibly have that technology, it, at least in 2004, and we don't think they have it right now. Mind blowing. He says some really interesting quote. Chad Underwood says, we're either alone in the universe or we're not. <laughs> Both ideas are equally terrifying. That's, that's very interesting to me. And I think it is equally terrifying. And, and you know, what's even more terrifying is going from one side to the other. <laughs> it's even, is even more terrifying. So parts, I got, I got a lot of information out of that. I mean, probably the biggest things that changed, really changed my mindset were uh, the jamming. Okay. I really got a lot more information out of that. That'll help me get closer on the Nimitz deep dive to get closer to this. And the E2, I didn't realize the E2 was out there as well. That adds another whole, another layer to the engagement. E2s, I mean, that's why they're there is to put that big giant radar looking down, 
you know, they have a bunch of sensors on there. They can see what's, what's shooting out. So I'm very interesting to hear what they had to say for the E2 Hawkeye. As always, guys, thanks for watching. I really do appreciate all your support. It helps a ton. I am starting a Patreon to try and make this channel more professional and start getting even better content out for you guys. Thanks for watching. Please like and subscribe. Next week, I'll be talking to Dave Fouch. He has some debrief points, especially for the live stream with Mick West, and he is a FLIR expert. So I'm very much looking forward to that. Have a great weekend, guys. Peace.